doing today? Hey, hello, welcome. I do believe you guys are the first sort of large group that we've had back at the Schweinfurth. Um, we have had a few classes, but they've been really small and very spaced out and everyone is wearing masks. So it is lovely to see everyone's faces today. Uh, my name is Devanna Robity. I'm the program director here at the Schweinfurth Art Center. And we're just incredibly excited to have this opportunity to pair writing with art. One of our main missions is to connect people in exactly this way. So we're ecstatic to have you guys here. And thank you for your thoughtful um, poems um, inspired by this work. So I'm going to turn it over to the CNY branch president. Welcome, Judith. Well, first I would love to thank um, Donna Lamb the executive director of the Schweinfurth Art Center for the past, I would say, five years, which it originally started when Mary Gardner came up with the idea, and she approached uh, Donna to see if we could have a collaboration, and this event is what they came up with. So I would also like to thank Devana for all of her hard work working with Nancy this year, and for Mar to Maria, I would say thanks so much for the beautiful program that you have done. So um, with no further ado, I will in, uh, invite Nancy Defoe to come up. But let me welcome everyone here this evening. It's so great to see everyone. Thank you so much, Judy. And thank you to the Schweinforth. We are the Central New York branch of the National League of American Pen Women. And we are a community of professional women writers, women artists, and women composers. The first poem I'm going to read is an ekphrastic response to John Galt's sculpture, Thorn. Listening to reactions to a sculpture in a museum, I hear, what's the big deal? It's a piece of corroded metal, oxidized, losing electrons, likely underwater. And then a woman stands long before the sculpture after her husband leaves and says to her friend, it reminds me of the bones in a hand. She flexes the tendons and muscles in her fingers. Suggests a feather half pulled apart by predator, says another. Thorn, a man muses about the title. Hardened by deposits in the sea, he remarks, walking away, as I observe the thickened, encrusted, irregular shape of lines oddly pleasing the eye, while my index finger extends in mimicry, almost without volition, still thinking about the familiar blue-green of corroded metal with points jutting out, insinuating something hard and sharp, but lingering in the expansive space around the sculpture, reminding me of something softer. And a line from Theodore Retke's poem reappears from journey into the interior. I pause once again at the recognition of the ways in which art draws us out, my mind now seeing a living reed with buds sprouting and pulled by wind, wind still impossibly playing with aspect. Thank you. My second ekphrastic response, a writer's thoughts on the enigmatic construct Azul. Close up as witness to glacial ice on thawing, melted water dropping down through crevices shown as penciled streaming surface near an edge. The earth too warm, not fragile, but neither is our mother immune to the catastrophes perpetrated by her children. River-like dark line widens off center, expanding in Recon's colored pencil drawing that suggests, insinuates, provokes ideas about our blue planet and her incomparable beauty, her vulnerability, as well as her fading end. Stephen King's riveting story, The Langoliers, comes to mind as thresholds appear to disappear in this art, mouths eating everything in their path, even our fading past. As I shake off these horrifying conceptions of leaving no trace of existence, that blue-white surface re reveals itself again with depth as sculpture of a blue-white brain. And I'm left marveling at the parallels and duplicates 
with irregular curves, rivulets of thought, flying across expanses of indeterminate length before deepening lines give the illusion of distorted bodies, human monstrosities stretched and pulled into dead or dying beasts before shaking my head, no, not beasts, victims of their own careless indifference to life, to our blue water planet, stillness and movement paradoxically present in this artist's labyrinth co construct in which illusions face off with reality or make demarcations between them then quietly and profoundly vanish. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. Um, so my first poem is going to be, Where Are You? Look around. What color is the earth? The texture of hills? Desert tan? Sedona red? Swamp black? Do you hear train whistles? Horns honk? Bagpipes? Cry of a loon? Southern drawl, tribal drumming, banjo strumming. Do you feel sand whip your face, arid dry, ocean breeze, wet dampened hair, frostbite on fingers, rocks beneath your feet? What smells swirl in the air, dairy barn? chicken coop, refried beans, seafood, Cajun, saffron. Open all of your senses. Where are you? And the next one is transitioning. And um, it's the trees and the leaves, and it's in that studio. Um, so I didn't put this in the poem, but I'll tell you guys something you might not know. The word is marcescent, so there are trees that hang on to their leaves until late spring. They don't drop them in the fall. These are deciduous trees, okay? So I found a tree like that on the nature trail, and I had to figure it out. Swamp white oak. There is a lovely tree on the nature trail with russet rattling leaves which refuse to let go. When the rains and winds of autumn fly off colorful leaves of other deciduous trees, this one is a rebel. Its leaves cling to its mother, defiant and actually smart. Leaves prefer to nourish its base after the early spring rains have swarmed earth fodder together which fed all roots beneath the ground. This tree believes in self-care, keeps its leaves until new growth actually pushes the brittle coppery brown leaves to the ground to nourish itself, kind of like college kids who move back home. <laughs> Remember, musical notes pull from black fabric, fill room with sound, sharps and flats, pitch perfect, swirl into spaces seeking song, history relies on familiar chants, Gregorian and other, metal drums, Hollow coconuts, flutes, didgeridoos, stream through woods between mountains, heard below decks on sailing ships, bulge from bugles, quiver taut strings, resonate to remember. Thank you. My first poem is a uh, about the quilt in the far room over there on the left. And 
it is, it is called 88 Years Adrift. So the title alone kind of grabbed my imagination. So my poem is Lifelines. When we lived on the farm, my mother hosted a circle of friends for a quilting bee. Fabric was stretched on a frame, four sides blocked by sets of legs. Libby and I played underneath, tried to guess which shoes belonged to which woman. Sometimes I tickled mother's toes, giggling when she jiggled away. Unlike Kevin Carr's abstract quilt, she used classic patterns, double wedding ring, log cabin, flower basket, to keep us warm in winter, squares cut from cloth from clothes damaged or outgrown. Last year's short sets, jumpers, blouses, the sailor dress I wore to Sunday school. I fondly remembered each one. As I grew, she taught me to sew. The last project we made together was a summer star with saved scraps of clothing worn by family now gone. Happy memories bonded me to 88 years adrift. An inverted sail tied to rigging with sailor hitch knots fixed against blue-black horizon, hints of lone star and night sky patterns reflected on a shimmering sea suggest sunrise or sunset. Pieces of color float away, mingle and merge, some returning with black clinging like barnacles. Random imperfections deliberate. I imagine the artist's disconnection, emotions of loneliness, grief. Time falls overboard, drowns. Night after night, he sleeps, rocked by waves of hope, despair. Stitches blend or contradict patches, sometimes disappear altogether. By patience, endurance, acceptance, a journey into inner depths, an artist saved by his own lifelines. My second poem is about that unusual installation, I'll call it, <laughs> in the center of the room next to us, um, called Specimen 784. Dream Collectors. A ship glides up the Amazon River, on board a, co a colleague of Darwin, hungry for knowledge, fame, a collector of rare birds, nests with eggs, and O oologist. Feathers, nests, a bird skeleton, empty clock case, mass of eggs in varying sizes and colors, specimens in space where time conveyed its passing to the living. As seen through a porthole, a creature, half bird, half woman, protects her egg to hatch a woman child. An artist's reimagining of a naturalist's dream. Every morning, my sister and I slipped on rubber boots, pulled baskets from the pantry, swished through dew to the hen house, ground splotched like a Pollock painting. Two rows of hens lay on nests of hay. A jewel thief, I slid my hand under warm bellies fingertips searching for eggs. To me, they were a breakfast staple, ingredient for desserts. While climbing a tree, I found a nest with tiny blue eggs. My sister said they would turn into baby robins. My mind veered from robins to chickens. Will eggs we collect and eat be baby chicks? The idea flooded me with disgust and guilt. She whispered, don't worry. Only roosters' girlfriends have baby chicks. <laughs> when I fell in love with my own rooster, I too had eggs. I dreamed they had become good, kind humans like all creatures must be, 
Hopeful their young will thrive in the world. When I sit at my desk and begin to write, I select words, dream of an embryo involving into a fully fledged poem, winging its way to another dreamer. Thank you. Thank you. Vanessa Johnson is the next person in your program, but she couldn't be here tonight because she got uh, five parts in a play that's starting tonight. Um, this was a surprise to her and she apologizes. She has some amazing poems, so I think um, maybe we can put them up on our uh, Central New York uh, Pen Women website and you can view them there as well. So our next poet to come up will be Mary Gardner. La my poem is called Last Conversation the one in the gallery after Bacon's Willow Two. It never occurred to me to frame you in, sec in sections as though to acknowledge your arboreal diversity even as you aged and grew to great height and shade. I remember you as vividly now as I did back then, our last conversation. I cannot stay away this morning, like the woodpecker relentless among your hollow places, the wren touching down on a low branch. I am compelled to attend to your last winter, old friend. Each day, more of your bark falls away, leaving naked, harder stuff, the core of what you have become. So shall it be for me. I capture you on film, straight on, still and alone, or posed with other old friends, the log shed you sheltered, the brook rushing by, the fir tree and the elderly sycamore. The wrens will miss you in the spring, the fireflies in June. I am with you till the end, old friend, as you are brought to earth crashing across the lawn and carried away in pieces, leaving chips and yellow wood dust like unsettled carpets around your vast ringed base, where lifelines running full and slender swirl through knots and darker places, your time here affirmed. And at the outer edges, mine too, our silent presence to each other by one of us remembered. This poem, Knitting Lesson, is after Quinn, Mashanguan, and Mary. Here in the cool surround of brick and stone, secluded space and slant of morning sun, the lesson begins. Slow, quiet clicking over and below through hoops and pulls of yarn and trust, hands and eyes bent on task. Life stories slip in, disappear in the pleasure of process, row after row, and the gift of time, one to the other. Thank you, Mary. Our next poet, Nancy Benson, could not be here tonight. So Bobby Panic is going to read her single poem. And uh, it's Freedom's Promise, and it's a painting by Robin Arnold. Freedom's Promise, a space provided, walking with the fresh grass, wafting through the air, inner depth of colors, muted pinks and blues, sensing each brushstroke, facing all surfaces with renewed strength to see sunlight and hope in future skies. I'm going to uh, read the next two poems. Uh, one is a response to Barbara Hart's Tangle and the second one is um, inspired by John Fitzsimmons' duo, and my poem is titled Doll. 
She sees herself for the first time as he sees her. Nothing more than mannequin, missing an arm, flawed to be discarded. Stuffed fabric of tightly woven cotton exposed beneath her smooth, softly pink layer of plastic. A murderous dark line between her neck and the base of her head is expanding. Her satin party dress, torn and dirtied, and its seams are not what they seemed. Even her bright red hair of bouncing curls was never her own. Her face turns away to that flat black plane of existence in which her resolve slowly tightens until, like the metal coils within, she springs back, picking up her limb and her chin before walking out of his scene to create one of her own. Her red cloak. She was up all night after a lumbar puncture with chemo, then ended up needing a blood transfusion. But by the time her nausea began to fade, it was the middle of the night when a nurse with the face of an angel brought her snacks and drink. Thank you, thank you, she thought, she said. Someone gave her a red blanket to warm her as she took a few tentative steps in the right direction. Still uncomfortable and in pain, she does not wince or cry, bravely imagining her flaming red blanket as the cloak of a dancer flying across the stage or as mantle of an ailing superhero Avenger because she will beat this unseen enemy with a little help. Someone told her the color red helps stimulate appetite and alleviate depression, but all she knows for certain is that she feels stronger wearing it, warmer, less anxious. In that interstitial hallway between illness and health, she is of two minds, almost two physical bodies, and she sees one turning away and one moving forward. Even though she knows a bone marrow biopsy awaits, months since her last one, she works to suppress the dread, but a growing headache causes her to make her way back to her hospital bed, where a young man is waiting not with flowers or silly comments, but an anxious and hopeful face, his hand reaching out as she crosses that threshold. From illness to health, he says with a slight smile. What, she asks, momentarily confused. That's where you are dancing off to, he says gently, helping her to the bedside. Oh, how did you? I saw you dancing in the hall. How could you? I, I only moved a few steps. Ah, but they were dancer steps. And I saw your other side leaving. She smiled. It's my red cloak, she says, lifting the red blanket with one unsteady hand and letting it fly away. Uh, so our next poet is Rachel Eikens. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I just want to say before I read the first poem, um, I wrote it for Juneteenth and I was inspired by the painting here which is over there, it's quite large. And black history and black lives matter and has been on my mind so much this year when I saw that painting, all of the thoughts that were swirling around coalesced into this poem. But I didn't want it to be a poem written by a white woman for white people. As I've seen um, a black poet friend of mine comment in a thread on Facebook about something else. So I um, trusted a young black woman poet who is full of so much energy and as a friend of mine, uh, with it and she printed it and she sent me photographs. She read it three times, each time with a different color pen. She wrote her thoughts in the margins and she uh, summed it up that it's a very strong poem. So the title of it as the title of the painting is here. From ships holds, bodies jumbled together Tribes, languages mixed in a sea of dehydration, diarrhea, terror, ever present the whiplash. 
dumped here in cages and lots, auctioned off, beaten, raped, worked to death in cotton and cane fields, pregnancy, no excuse to stop. So many attempts to escape into swamps, chased by dogs, caught, hung, trussed, and flogged on an immaculate lawn while petticoated white women and men barbecued pork ribs, ate at a linen-draped table close enough you could smell the food. As your flesh striped, divots dropped, snatched by dogs, your manhood cut away and still white children played. Adults sipped juleps. You ignited, flames took your voice, your people ordered to stand here. Then the war, the signature that said free, one June 19th, fleeing north to cities, untrained in anything but field work, struggles to adapt to freedom, to more spit on your cheeks. You raised white children, worked their railroads, bathrooms, bus seats, schools, your own, not equal, here. They cut down the woods behind your old house and left a naked field. No houses, no life except that of tiny feet living their lives below the surface. Grasses and wildflowers spread roots, adapted to hardship, to men with chainsaws, heavy machinery. Sold, asphalt, buried trillium, bloodroot, goldenrod. Self-storage units appeared and with them sedge grasses and other plants too stubborn to die, cracking the pavement to reach sunlight, to drink rain, outlasting rusted bulldozer blade, staying alive as you stay alive, trudging through storms of bigotry, marching, bandaged wounds, found a seat on a bus, at a counter stool, at a diner, work three jobs to feed your kids, make do and make do and make do until you send your eldest to college, first university student in the family. You never forget that weight, tar burning skin. June 19th, 2021, after a year of too many more black men and women murdered, a single white killer held accountable. One. Your clouds of kinky hair, your woven nests of bundled braids, skin mahogany to lightest cream, sensuous colors with music that speaks to the heart in ways no beetle or rolling stone ever will. Aretha insisted, respect, you say, I am here, I am everywhere. Thank you. And then my other poem was written to, um, yeah, Willow Two. It's a very short poem. <laughs> Survivor. Woolish wrists, fur willow trunk, claw towards sun's suck, love's long, slow strangulation. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And our second to the last poet is Janet Fagel. Alone, 2021. The alarm sounds, quiet now, the teacher says, hurry, duck and cover. I am 10, somehow I know this desk, these walls will not save us from a nuclear bomb or radiation sickness. I imagine myself after, frightened, hungry, alone. What if my family died? If everyone was gone, what would I want to survive? In my dreams, I watch a girl in a train car, no one else in sight. The train on an endless loop travels from station to station, every seat save hers empty. I am glad when the coldness of this nightmare finally ends. It is 2020, I am old. The new millennium arrived in style with great hope and fanfare. At least for a while I was hopeful that, a be that better days were ahead, but then 
Now we are in lockdown worldwide, afraid, worried, incredulous. The enemy, a virus, invisible, tiny, unknown, deadly. Call the novel coronavirus, a name that seems oxymoronic to me. I love books, especially poetry and novels, and new things. Even enjoy a Corona beer every now and then. At first, this seems a silly name. But this virus is no joke. It's a pandemic. Millions die alone in hospitals. Nurses' cell phones and iPads, the only link to panicked family, the only way to say goodbye. My cousin dies from the virus, alone. Others I know lose loved ones. Still others suffer from lasting effects. When we finally emerge from our cocoons, masked, sanitized, and blessedly vaccinated, I feel tentative, off kilter, unsure. I am in need of art more than food, friends more than books, and hope more than anything. In a gallery, I see a painting of a girl on a train. The mask she wears is illusory. It keeps her from spreading germs, but it will not protect her. She sits on this train, alone, tiny and scared. I am pulled back in time. Has this painter dreamed my dream? I shake my head. There are too many questions. Where I wonder is hope. Thank you so much, Janet. To finish up the evening, I have uh, two last poems. Uncertainty, inspired by Cora Jane Glasser's Holding Patterns Number no. 7. As in other world mythologies, bizarre because we are so programmed to recognize location, but now displaced. Shakespeare's plays, his comedies, and his tragedies imbued with uncertainty as we experience this most unsettling state. And we find ourselves in the midst of it again and again, approaching Glasser's holding pattern number seven. Even the texture of oil on linen canvas causing hesitancy. Ambiguity dominates with lines between offerings of sky and skyline before upended. Position and place recognized as cityscaped and displaced world. Space between East River and Brooklyn or Hudson and Manhattan, only figments of the imagination here in this voluminous space in Art Center Locus and the work of art. No more than a rectangle of blue with brown streaks below and hints of vertical buildings through partial markings, the mind eye takes them all the way to windows. Grays and blues of deepening shades are manifest and then there are suddenly appearing black post markings, also suggestive, but of what? In that gray blue cement colored sky or upside down in the East River again in which the black floating posts become abandoned pier markers? Even in abstraction, we imagine what is subtly suggested, the mind filling in the spaces with images we have seen before in their water-based transference of medium to fluidity, altering realistic abstract, a work the writer will view, and people in this other world in which walking is outlawed and transport achieved through visualization. This alternative place is technological yet primitive, in shape with black warning posts overhead, spires not of churches, but needle-like points of incision into the body of a surreal world still recognizable as our own uncertainty. And the very last one, two ladderback chairs. Two ladderback chairs on deep inky canvas, the eye tracking similarity and symmetry without consciously acknowledging principles behind Carlson's design in which emphasis on the simplicity of two chairs is of equal weight. But the movement and patterns created by linen cloth instructs in variety 
while reinforcing repetition and construct in topography. So aligned was William Carlos Williams' red wheelbarrow beside the white chickens, a poem in which simplicity held nothing less than the secrets of creating art. Balance, emphasis, pattern, unity, proportion, hierarchy established, white linen suggesting sacraments, a chalice veil, an altar cloth, in various positions, asymmetrical yet of equal weight on their deliberately off-centered line, white for purifying in liturgical practice, yet the pop of contrast against rich blue-black frame belies hierarchy, smaller elements lighter with greater import, chairs empty. Color psychology at work in Carlson's background of mimetic desire suggesting stability, calming presence, reliability, and strength to offset muted yellow of the pine chairs and fine white linen, his painting perfection in aesthetic and design principle, subtly referencing Van Gogh's two paintings of chairs, one of somber wood and the second Gauguin's counterbalance, empty chairs, symbolic of mortality and the tension between. Only if Carlson's untitled two chairs is viewed beside his next in sequence will viewers notice the juxtaposition of ladder back chairs upended, liturgical cloths astray in the second, gestalt principles at work in both, yet quietly subverted. Secrets of the artist right in front of you. Thank you so much.